Hi, this is Joel Duff from thenaturalhistorian.com, and I'm back to talk about coronavirus once again. I said a couple of days ago that I that I wouldn't be talking about it uh, anymore, at least for a while. And just a few days later, here I am telling you, let's talk about coronavirus. But I have a little twist on it this time. We're not going to talk about coronavirus in humans. We're going to talk about coronavirus in white-tailed deer. So I saw this report about white-tailed deer. It comes from a preprint uh, paper on the biology server. That means it's not a peer-reviewed journal, but it has been picked up by some major news, uh, major science news organizations, but also in the popular press uh, have caught wind of this. And so I've been seeing a lot of reports about how many white-tailed deer have had COVID, uh, usually with sort of sort of scare quotes uh, around it. And so I wanted to address the you know, what that paper said, whether we should be concerned with it or not, and so forth. So let's get right to that. Let me share my screen. The claim is that 40% of white-tailed deer have had COVID-19. Right Now, that's that's the claim that I see, or I see something like 40% of white-tailed deer have COVID-19 or have had COVID-19. I want to ask, is that really true? And if so, should you be concerned? Right? Should you be concerned that white-tailed deer have COVID out there? So let's go right to the paper. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 exposure in wild white-tailed deer by a variety of authors here from the National Wildlife Research Center and Wildlife Disease Program. Now, I, I, I like this particular, when I started looking into this, I, I found it interesting from a just like how science works perspective. Um, this is a group who didn't come along and say, oh, I wonder if uh, white-tailed deer have been exposed to COVID. Now, this is a group that had been already been working on white-tailed deer, uh, interested in their health and uh, you know population levels and so forth over a long period of time. And they had started another project uh, in which they were looking at, uh, they were taking sera, that means blood samples, from white-tailed deer uh, well before the pandemic pandemic occurred for a variety of different reasons, and they had stored those samples. And then, of course, the pandemic hits, and there is uh, concern that uh, COVID-2 or the, the COVID-19 uh, virus could actually spill back into various other animals, right? I mean, COVID-2 came from an animal and entered into humans, all right, spilled over from animals into humans. It is possible it could spill back into other animal lineages. We know cats and dogs and minks, and there's a bunch of other things, hamsters have all been shown uh, to contract uh, SARS-CoV-2 from human beings. So they had this supply already of, of blood samples that they could test. And so they tested them, right? They, they looked at them. They said, oh, we have samples from before the pandemic and after the pandemic. And we can ask, did white-tailed deer have antibodies? So for the first thing to learn here is they're not actually testing whether the, the white-tailed deer actively have SARS-CoV-2 virus in them. Right. Remember, that's your um, that's your PCR test that we do if you uh, think you have an active case of COVID-19, you would get the, the PCR test that would show that you have an active virus, that the virus is in you at that moment. If you want to find out a month later after you've already had COVID, whether you had COVID, all right, you want to confirm that, then you would do an antibody test, right, or a serological test in which you look for the presence of antibodies in the blood that have been built by the immune system that are prepared then for if you ever were to be contract uh, the COVID virus again. So what they're doing here is they say we have the blood and we're going to test for the antibodies for SARS-CoV-2, which would then suggest that that particular individual deer uh, at one time must have had the virus in order to have had its immune system generate antibodies for that particular virus. So what did they find? Very intriguingly, they found that many white-tailed deer in eastern U.S. Now, here's where the 40 percent comes in. Uh, the 40% just comes from the number of individuals that they sampled uh, and how many actually showed positive for COVID or, or antibodies. And that was 40% from 2021 samples. Um, so not all of their samples, because they have samples from before the pandemic, and those did not show any antibodies for SARS-CoV-2, except for one uh, exception, which I'll show you in a moment. 
And so if you looked at them all, you wouldn't get that 40 percent. But of course, what we want to know is what did the pandemic cause or what could the pandemic have caused if it had spilled that spilled over into white tailed deer? And of the deer that they had sampled, 40 percent of them had evidence that they had contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2. So here's some of the data. Um, and so first, this is only from four states. So for example, I'm in Ohio. We have plenty of white-tailed deer. They haven't sampled any white-tailed deer in Ohio. So I couldn't say that 40% of deer in Ohio uh, have had uh, SARS-CoV-2. Neither would I say that 40% of the deer in any state has had uh, SARS-CoV-2. That's an average over these four different states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, and Illinois. But you'll see that in Michigan, uh, this N would be the number of deer sampled uh, that they had samples of, and this is the number of positive. You'll see like in, in these particular counties, they had 34 individuals from one, one area and 25 of them. So that's 74% of them. And in some cases, all the samples they had uh, in their collection all had were seropositive, meaning they, they have antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. And then in, in Pennsylvania, we also had fairly high numbers. Uh, in Illinois, generally, the numbers were fairly low. Uh, it was just one area of Illinois where there's uh, more prevalence of these. And then you have some in New York. Right? But you can see from this, probably you would predict that if you looked at Ohio and Indiana and uh, uh, West Virginia and Virginia and so forth, that you might expect, we probably would expect that we'd find uh, a smattering of CoV-2 uh, um, antibodies in those white-tailed deer too. So I don't think it's unfair to suggest that white-tailed deer in general have have had many have had uh, SARS-CoV-2 from this data. Now, one of the questions you might ask is, well, how reliable is this data? All right, are they really identifying antibodies from SARS-CoV-2 and not, let's say, other coronaviruses? So if, you, if you've heard or if you've listened to any of my other talks, you'll know that there are other coronavirus strains, but right? there's the original SARS from 2000 and, uh, 2004, 2003, 2004. And then there are a variety of other coronaviruses that cause common colds in human beings. So maybe that common cold virus, coronavirus, has spilled over into white-tailed deer, and they have built antibodies for those, and that's what we're detecting. But that wouldn't be the case. This paper explains, I think, very thoroughly that they actually tested the kit that they used to test for the antibodies. That kit has been thoroughly tested against the other strains of coronavirus. And, uh, you know, 99 percent of 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 positive samples are for SARS-CoV-2. And once in a while, there might be might be cross what they call cross reactivity with another strain of coronavirus giving a positive result. And in that case, it was with, it was with SARS, not uh, OC43 or HK51 or O1 or any of those other strains. And the SARS strain is the most similar one to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so that's not terribly surprising. But we also wouldn't expect to find a whole lot of SARS, original SARS, in deer here in the United States when SARS really never came to the United States. Remember, the original SARS outbreak was in Southeast Asia, and although there were a couple individuals that managed to travel to other parts of the world, um, I, I guess it's possible one of them traveled to the eastern U.S. and maybe uh, gave it to a deer, and maybe that was in that population, but that seems extremely unlikely. Um, so nonetheless, here's what here's what the data is showing. So here we have they have samples from previous uh, blood collections that they were able to sample and look back all the way to 2011. And so everything below this line here is considered to be a negative result. So inhibition would be how much of the um, antibody in the I'm sorry, how much of the. Um, the virus in this kit, right, is is reacted to to the antibody uh, that uh, that they're that they are um, that's in the blood that's in the sera, all right. So how much of a reaction is there? Uh, and if there's just a, a tiny bit of reaction, this is basically background noise. You can get this with almost anything that you were to throw at this kit, uh, and so it doesn't show any any strong reaction at all. It's just the background reaction you expect. Uh, to get with anything that you would put in it. So it's a negative control. Uh, but if it rises above this particular uh, point, above 30%, uh, 
uh, that's considered to be like a, you know a significant amount of inhibition or cross reactivity, and therefore the antibody there must be antibodies that are specific to that particular um, uh, uh, virus. All right. Uh, that spike protein that, that they're they're giving uh, they're I guess they could say you're showing to the sample which is the sera and seeing what kind of reaction you get and so you can see here in 2021 all these red dots represent uh, individual deer which had reactivity you know some just barely but some had very very strong reactions um, suggesting a lot of antibody in their blood this is the same is true for human beings right if you were to test 100 individuals who have already had uh, coronavirus and then ask what their reactivity is. You know, one that might have uh, had a very mild case, maybe didn't really had much of an immune reaction, might not show a whole lot of response. They might not have built a whole lot of antibody. Uh, and, and many will have very large amounts of antibody. And as an aside, this is one of the reasons why and it's hard to predict. Some people who had very uh, strong cases of coronavirus still might not produce a lot of antibody. And that would be another reason why getting a vaccine is good, because vaccinations generally have been shown to produce a large amount. Now, let me get my uh, marker out here. And, uh, uh, the vaccines have been shown to, to give very strong antibody responses on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it's still recommended to get a vaccine even after having COVID, because you still might end up down here, which would leave you in a position of potentially being able to uh, get COVID again. All right, so then you'll see that there are some samples from 2020, which also reacted. And then there's this odd one right here. There was one sample uh, which just barely meets, meets the line of significance, uh, and which they're saying from 2019, late 2019. So now what is that one? You know, that one potentially could have been a, a cross reactivity with the original SARS, because like I said, how likely is it that there was SARS in the in the uh, deer population, and uh, SARS was a long time ago, so it had to persist in the deer population. Or maybe it could be one of the very rare cases where it, you know, one out of uh, 10,000 or 100,000 uh, samples of the other strains of coronavirus might have had a mutation or something that allows it to cross-react with this particular kit, which is supposed to be looking for SARS-CoV-2, but rare things like rare mutations can happen. And so maybe there was cross reactivity with a another cold virus, uh, which very much, very well could be in uh, deer lineages. They may, I mean, deers get a variety of different kinds of colds and respiratory diseases too. And so maybe that's all that is, but it does raise the intriguing possibility as well that uh, SARS-CoV-2, which some people have thought, uh, arrived a little earlier in the United States than uh, most people think, which is that usually think that it's probably late December or uh, more like, most most likely in uh, the year 2020, but possibly a little bit earlier. Of course, this also requires that that SARS-CoV-2 also made it to the eastern U.S. and then somehow got transferred to deer. And by the way, what are we talking about when we say like spilling back into deer? How does that happen? Well, they don't know, right? You know, how did they get back into deer? Um, you know, here's where these deer are located. Uh, and so how do they get into these deer? If it requires somebody having coronavirus and walking around the woods and like coughing and then a deer walks by a little later and breathes it up and that's how it transfers, um, you know, that's that seems pretty unlikely. And it seems even more unlikely to me that that would be the primary way it happened when you consider where all these deer are. All right. You have positive deer in all these locations. I know deer get around, but deer aren't necessarily traveling over a, per a period of a few months through all, you know, across all these areas, all right? And so if you if it was a rare event, you'd expect it to happen maybe one time, and then that deer then spreads it to other deer. Um, they do have a, they do, it, it has been shown with previous uh, other viruses that they, they will, they get nasal congestion and they will pass each other's and also through feces as well. So how did they get it? I'm just going to speculate here that it was probably not directly human to deer, but potentially it is human to dog, right? Or human to cat, all right? And then feces out in the woods, uh, which deer are near munching or eating somewhere close, or maybe dogs or wild dogs that they contact 
uh, or mice, or there's other rodents as well that could have uh, SARS-CoV-2. And that's the thing about this, you know, about CoV-2 is that um, it, it really, it, because of the protein that it attaches to, it's having a relatively easy time finding new hosts. Uh, and apparently deer uh, easily take up this particular virus uh, and it spreads. Now, how deadly is it in deer? Probably not very deadly. I mean, there hasn't been any pandemic of, of that anyone's noticed of more deer dying than usual. And so it appears that it probably is just an upper respiratory disease uh, in them. But all of this raises the intriguing, you know, here's where I go back to my, my title and my question. It's like, you know, is this true? Well, okay, it is true. I, I, I believe that these deer probably have had coronavirus, CoV-2 virus. Um, now, I, I know there's, there's got to be people out there scouring deer right now, and they're trying to find ones that have an active infection because they want to extract the DNA. And what I'll be very interested in, and I'll probably be back when this comes out, uh, what I'll be very interested in is, did those, you know, what does the sequence look like? Is it exactly like a human version, or was there a mutation that occurred that maybe allowed it to get into deer and is better adapted to the deer receptors on their cells. If that's the case, then spill back to humans is not very likely, right? So even if all the deer in your neighborhood uh, may be spreading uh, coronavirus around among themselves and they do tend to gather together, right? And stay very close together. So it's not hard to imagine how they're giving it to one another. Um, except for over long distances, which is why I think this is happening multiple times in many different places. And, and by the way, that's testable because when we finally go and somebody actually samples deer from these places and captures the actual virus in them, my get, here's my guess is that uh, it won't be exactly like the human version. It'll be a, a variant, uh, a mutation that then uh, develops in a particular population of deer. But then when we sample deer from, say, New York or Pennsylvania's case, maybe their variants are different than the ones in Illinois. If that's the case, then that is evidence for two separate introductions into deer. Now, if all the deer have the same exact version of coronavirus and it's different than humans, that would suggest a single time that it got into a deer and then somehow the deer have spread it to all other deer on the east in the eastern U.S. Again, I think that's unlikely, but that's a hypothesis. That hypothesis can be tested. I'm sure we'll have the data someday to be able to resolve which of those hypotheses is more uh, more likely. Um, all right, so back to the back to the thing of should I be concerned? And like like I think I was just saying is that I don't think that this is a, a big concern. I'm I'm not very worried about it. If it's not exactly like the human version, it won't spill back very easily into humans. So in other words. Uh, a coughing deer out there is not necessarily going to create a whole new pandemic in humans again. But if it, it is significant, if it is almost identical or identical to maybe some human strains, uh, then I guess there is the possibility that even if we squashed coronavirus in, in a particular area, the deer might give it back to us. Um, and, you know, can't rule out that possibility. Can't rule out the possibility, too, that it would mutate in deer to create a new variant, which then would spill back to humans. But I want to stress that that's, that, that is an extremely rare event. And so although almost anything is possible, that is highly improbable and highly unlikely and not something that we would, that anyone should, you know, lose sleep over. Um, but it does mean that scientists should keep track of this stuff. They're, they're, you know, doing, you know, doing these kind of surveys is important because uh, it allows us to watch the evolution of this virus and to be able to see what it may be doing before, you know, before worse symptoms uh, show up. All right. So uh, let's see. What else was I going to say about this paper? Um, I think that's it. I think that's all the major points. Um, yeah. So deer, probably many deer have had coronavirus. It's probably actively spreading right now. Most of these samples were from 2021. Uh, and so there is a pandemic of coronavirus in white-tailed deer. Uh, and chances are white-tailed deer are probably going to spread it to other similar uh, or other ungulates uh, like themselves. And so I think we're going to see the permeate. I think we're going to see COVID permeating through many, many different species over time. And what we might find is that in one species, eh, it doesn't do a whole lot. 
all right, has just minor effect on them. Whereas in another one, it may truly cause, you know, a, a large die off in some species as they adapt uh, to a particular viral strain. Um, the biggest danger in my mind would be bats that are around uh, deer and then spilling into bats because bats seem to be particularly susceptible and seem to be excellent hosts for coronavirus because that's where, well, hundreds and hundreds of variants of, of variations or species, if you want to call that, call it that, of coronavirus are found in bats all over the world. Uh, and they're the primary, they've been the primary source that have infected other animals, which eventually then affect us. And so, as I said in my last video, coronavirus is a fairly young family, and it's you can think of it as like a brand new thing that is exploring all the space of different organisms that it could possibly infect. Uh, and so, white-tailed deer don't have any evidence of, actually, I think they've done geological studies even for some other coronavirus strains in a lot of animals and not found uh, them. And but now we're starting to see, oh, like, here's this strain. Here's this strain. This is showing up. And I think this will become more and more and more common. In other words, the world's going to be just enveloped in. I'm making it sound really dramatic, but um, hundreds of species around us eventually may end up with their own coronavirus strains, which just increase the. Even though it's remote, it still increases the chance that new strains will then reenter or spill back into uh, the human race. Okay, now I really am done. Again, my name is Joel Duff, and uh, you can read uh, my works at thenaturalhistorian.com. And uh, thanks for listening. I will talk to you later.